All right, I think this is a third video in the the only one field theory series of videos. So I think I'll go into a little bit of the structure uh, arguments about how the atoms manifest uh, electricity and magnetism, and even the creation of photons may likely be in this uh, segment, hopefully. Um, sorry, I don't have a pre-written um, spiel, so we'll just go through some of the basic concepts. So, as I've sort of attempted to point out, um, there's two elements, um, you know, fundamental to what atoms do, the electron and the proton, and they behave uh, reciprocally opposite each other in the sense that they reflect energy of their same type. Uh, we'll just constitute that as a reflection. You should be able to get it. So the energy comes in. Uh, the same type. And use that a double arrow or something. <laughs> and um, it excretes. Um, that energy back just whatever you give it it gives back so and then when the opposite kind of energy the uh, hits a proton for example uh, it's excreted in some perpendicular dimension so one of the four perpendicular dimensions and likewise for the electron so any imbalance coming in one direction will end up leaving in another direction. You can kind of get that in a 90 degree uh, change in that direction. So you could see that extra pressure coming in this direction would be excreted uh, in the sideways direction. Sort of indicating that a force can come into something and that a current or something like it could be created um, perpendicular to that event. All right, um, be better if this camera was the other way around. But anyway, <laughs> it doesn't matter. All right, so that's the basic concept. So if you haven't watched the previous videos, then you really should. So the idea is there's this is the only field there is, is these black and red arrows. And anything that moves, any time one of these uh, atomic bits moves, or the atom itself moves, it moves because a force affected it. All right, so the atoms themselves, I would argue, are not this stuff swirling around, but that they are essentially magnetic, and that things are locked in positions by this magnetic tension. So there's repulsion between the electrons, and there's a lack of pressure between the electron and the proton. And you can understand the lack of pressure would be because there's no reflections. Black can't reflect to red. The black goes out perpendicularly on the red. And the red energy goes out perpendicularly on the black. And so there's very little energy trapped between them. And therefore no repulsion. Where you can understand that if it's black and black, then all the energy going directly between them will end up being reflected. And can be reflected more than once. Many reflections. So understand that every one of these little atomic bits is essentially just radiating force constantly. All the force that comes in just gets radiated back out. And the idea is to set them up in networks where there's places where there's higher pressure and places where there's lower pressure, which bonds things together. So the idea is that the uh, electrons are all repulsive, that is, and there is, if you try to move them closer together, they will repel that movement. Uh, and they are attracted to the center. So you can sort of understand if I try to push this electron in with extra force, there's going to be resistance from the other electrons. They're going to feel that pressure and push back. They're going to reflect more energy. There'll be less distance between this electron and this electron. That less distance means more pressure, means more impacts, more getting hit means it's it's going to repel that action and so it takes a certain amount of energy to break that bond and that's something commonly known in physics the idea that you have to 
you have to break these bonds um, with extra energy. Um, can't do it little bits at a time. You have to hit them hard to be able to push them far enough to break the pressure between the electrons. So anyway, uh, moving to the more relevant um, argument. All right, so um, a magnet um, is basically doing this filtering stuff on an atomic level. So it's made of a bunch of little magnets inside. I'll just illustrate them cheaply, <laughs> you know, by putting some black and red dots in here, indicating the arrangement of the electrons and the protons. And that arrangement has a bias in a direction, so the magnet essentially radiates more black energy from one end and more red from the other. And it also reflects, likewise, more red and black. So it's essentially become a giant atom in a sense um, where it's duplicating some of the shape or some of the dynamics that's inside of an atom. And this dynamic of the electron and the protons relationship is very much the same as the dynamic of this big magnet, you could say. Um, <clears throat> and the same principles are hold. Now the difference is this might be 60% more. I'm, I'm you know, uh, black this, this side, so there's still black here but it's just a lot less. So it could be 60, 40, it could be 70, 30, you know, those, the, there requires a certain, um, you have to go much deeper to be able to figure out what those numbers are. But the idea is there's a difference and that's all you really need to cause something to move is a little bit of a difference. So if an object is in a neutral condition, uh, minding its own business and has the same amount of pressure coming from both sides, you can understand it's not going to go anywhere. And what a magnet does is it creates more pressure, and that means reflections, and that means <laughs> repulsion. And likewise, if you invert the circumstance and have the red force, um, you can understand that more red force going into an electron just means more to be uh, dissipated in a direction and in a magnet the direction would be one direction that is towards the red end of the magnet um, so so now let's understand what happens when that uh, force so again it's always if something happens if something changes if you induce something you have to induce it with a force and the force has to be consumed to create a change if it isn't consumed in some way um, and then uh, you know it has to be readmitted um, if it's going to cause change somewhere else I mean it's a uh, it's consumed as either a change in the position of the material bit or the material bit if it is going to essentially reflect something it has to essentially first absorb it and then reflect it there's no doing both at the same time you, you can't just reflect a photon um, and uh, likewise you can't move something without consuming the energy of a photon and so you could sort of understand that if it, if I drew a photon let's see if I can <laughs> do it over here it, you know a photon flying into something and we assume that the something moves and then we say well that's because it hit it well then the photon would stop the photons don't stop. You don't have dead photons lying around. So they have to literally be absorbed by the matter for the matter to move. So that's something to understand that this electron's not going anywhere until it absorbs the higher pressure. It has to actually consume it, um, some portion of it. And, and so there's a consumption of this force when there's interaction. So let's say we have a conductor or a wire and we put it in the in, in the vicinity of a field. And let's say the field is, you know, I have the magnet in its dipolar position, but let's say the magnet's in the head first position. And so it's radiating force and we're coming towards, we're gonna move it towards a conductor. And the conductor is basically just these atoms and positions. And so what's gonna happen is it's going to get the pressure, this black force, this is the, the north end. And this, the same goes for the expansion or contraction. I mean, whether you're expanding an atom or contracting an atom, 
the net effect will be the same in the sense you're going to change the polarity of the atom in that in, in that position so so um, how do I draw this so we can do uh, all right well at time a okay let's say the atom um, so we have the position of these electrons and um, they're in some neutral position and in that neutral position the overall atom is neutral in the sense that the distance between this proton and this electron means that when you get to this spot when the, the, the power of the red force gets to this location that is the divergence of it there'll be just as much energy as there is coming off the electron so they'll be equally spaced that is their divergences because the electron is much smaller the divergences will be the same and so their forward progress will be an equal force so depending on how far away the electrons are sort of dictates how balanced the force is between the electron and the proton and decides whether this atom has a charge so the idea is when this black force comes in it's going to hit this electron and that electron is now going to compress and so the atom will have a a different shape um, so it'd be flatter on one side than the other no, I didn't draw that very well um, but the idea would be is this line dot 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 <laughs> you know, well yeah, the two atoms are now so close to each other put this line there um, so this atom is compressed. This this electron moved in a little bit. Uh, it absorbed the extra energy. There was more hitting it from this side than from this side, so it moved into the, the pressure, and that pressurized these other electrons. Um, in this in in the, as that happens, so it absorbed the extra field energy, compressed this electron, spread that pressure to these other electrons, which are going to spread it to any electrons they're connected to. So. I probably shouldn't have divided these atoms, but you can understand that these electrons are bonding the atoms together. And so the third electron will have more pressure and it'll push into the other electron and create more pressure in the other atom. And so the pressure through the conductor can move. Now, so while this is happening, so while this pressurizing is happening, this atom itself now has a, a side here. So understand the atom is almost being flat on one side and round on the other so it now has a flat side where the electrons are much more compressed okay there's a less of that hexagon so if you were to think of it as like a hexagonal shape um, that was kind of holding everything together it's now flat on this side flatter this can't be perfectly flat so it I should just draw it slightly flat <laughs> all right um, and so now you can sort of understand that the distance from the proton to this electron versus this electron is very different and the distance between that is really important because the electron is essentially a shield for the strength of the proton so um, basically the closer you push the electron towards the proton the more the atom itself becomes more of a uh, you know, uh, 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 let's use the black for representing the electron force and red representing the proton force. The electron is literally blocking more of the uh, the the um, proton force, so it's now becoming more of an electron atom. So its profile to the world is the atom is now becoming an electron atom which I should have drawn in black okay instead of a, 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 a proton strong atom or a neutral atom so in a sense you can understand that everything starts becoming everything can become a, 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 an electron type monopole or a, a proton type monopole atoms themselves can sort of become monopoles now I probably should have drawn it this way to indicate that it's 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 more of a an electron <laughs> atom on one side and maybe more of a proton atom on the other side because of this change in the pressure um, because this 
some of the pressure might go this way and cause these electrons to go further away from the proton and um, so it can create a dipole um, but not necessarily uh, is you know the point I'm going to make it depends on whether it's a conductor or an insulator uh, whether the force can be transmitted in that direction um, so the idea is is now this has become the same force producer more brown more black than red as the force that came in so the original force is black the a little extra black you know 90 10 it just doesn't matter a little bit more brown now this is going to reflect more brown than red and so you can sort of see that that's going to create this opposite uh, repulsive reaction that you see in paramagnetism especially um, and the pressure and, and it's only going to have that character as long as this atom remains compressed. So the idea is, is the pressure has to, you know, if the pressure can escape, then this atom can go back to normal and repressurize. But if the pressure can't go somewhere, you know, if there's no way for the pressure to be um, um, taken away, and I would argue, it can't go this way in a conductor okay so the way the conductors are made the pressure has to move this way through the conductor it can't move both ways so you can't just fix the pressure by moving it to this other side you have to essentially move it across the surface and if there's not a if there's no way to get around the surface the surface is a rectangle for example it won't go around this corner you know, it's just the way it, the way it is. There's no pressure connection. So with the pressure connections, the atoms are bound going this way, and they can't do corners. <laughs> so if there's a corner, it won't go around the corner and come around this other side to equalize the pressure. So essentially, once you pressurize it, then you've pressurized it, and it can't get any more pressure. Um, and nothing else, nothing will change. Um, Let's see, no, I'm saying this the wrong way now. All right, well, I have too much drawing on here anyway, so we'll go back one step. Because I think I said it exactly backwards. Okay. So, um, all right, so, so we have a force coming in it has created essentially atom that is going to be producing the same excess in force so I'm just going to draw them in one color to indicate that this has a bias in that force color so the this has been the induction so this was a magnet so it has some imbalance built into it it's imposing that imbalance on these atoms these atoms are compressing okay which makes the that gives them the bias because now the proton is being blocked by the electron um, more of it's it's like the earth being closer to the sun and how it would block more of the sun from a distance like if you were sitting on saturn and i move the earth closer and closer and closer to the sun you can understand it would create a more and more of an ellipse uh, an eclipse of the sun so the same principles involved here i think so it's going to keep reflecting all right, until something changes um, to, to mean that this pressure doesn't exist anymore. And so the idea is, in a conductor, um, that pressure will escape. Um, it can just go atom to atom to atom. So this atom, although it's pressurized now, it's next to an atom that's not pressurized. So an atom that's, see, I don't have a color to make neutral with, so <laughs> I'll, oh, maybe I'll just draw both colors for a neutral. Well, maybe put a red dot in the middle of a neutral. So a, a, there's a neutral atom next to this one, let's say. So let's say there's 10 of these in a row and they're all getting pressurized. Well, there's a certain, eventually there's gonna be an atom that's not pressurized as much because it's far further away from the, from the magnetism. So you can understand that stuff will be close and stuff will be far away stuff far away is not going to get pressurized as much. So 
there's going to be a pressure difference between these two neighboring atoms and the pressure from one is going to transfer to the pressure to the other and this pressure won't be on just the surface anymore it'll be around the whole atom and so it's going to be now kind of just electricity um, um, well that's, this isn't okay so no never mind it, it let's just say it also the pressure is also in line with the electrons being pr compressed so the, the surface electron this one the one facing the magnet was the one compressed the one that's going to be affected is going to be the surface one here the one that's going to be affected is going to be the surface ones <sighs> probably all right well anyway the idea is as you can understand it'll move the pressure from one atom to another atom and they'll just keep reshaping and then they go flat again and then they reshape and they go flat again uh, as long as there's somewhere for this pressure to go so as long as the pressure can move or escape they'll um, they'll move the pressure but if the pressure can't escape that is it can't move through the conductor because the conductor doesn't have an outlet there's no there's nothing you know there's no connection to the end of the conductor so there's too much of a gap whatever then the pressure increases and it just goes along the entire conductor will accept more and more pressure as the magnet moves so the faster you move it the it affects how much of this you change how quickly you know because you're just adding to the pressure I mean the the speed that you're moving just adds to the pressure now even though stuff moving the speed of light you're going to create a higher amount of that pressure if you move the stuff moving the speed of light quickly so if you move a flashlight into somebody yes you're not making the light go faster but you're going to have them get hit by more photons because they're not going to just be hit from photons from a further distance they're going to be hit by photons from a closer distance so that's an increase in the pressure so moving the magnet fast will create more pressure moving it slow will create less <coughs> over time um, whether in the end they add up to the same I'm not sure I have to think about that uh, <laughs> but anyway alright so if the pressure can escape then um, uh, yeah so the, the effect is keeps happening as long as you're applying the pressure now if you just stop then you could argue okay you're still applying pressure you're flattening these atoms but they've already been flattened and once they've moved that is once they've changed the ones next to them then all you're doing is increasing how flat they are you know, they just stay flat because they can't get any flatter once they're flat they're flat and once they're next to somebody who's flat they can't transfer flat so it doesn't matter how once you've made this atom flat and the atom next to it and the atom next to it and there's no atom next to it that's unflat and that's the way to say it if there's no atom next to it that's unflat that is not a neutral then none of this pressure can go anywhere and that's when the current stops because no matter how much pressure you build up here it can't go anywhere it can't be transmitted to anything and so it's you know and so the only thing that part that becomes relevant I guess is if you bring it close enough you may be able to disturb the atoms behind those atoms you know but I can't say that for sure either. Uh, you probably already have somewhere in the process of this whole thing of conducting. Um, so any, anyway, this is the idea. So the idea is once the pressure gets trapped where it doesn't have any other atom to exchange with, that's when everything just stops and everybody says, okay, there's no current. You know, it only happens when the field is moving. Well, the field needs to be moving because the the eventually and it has to be moving in both directions essentially it has to be more than just moving it has to move it has to be brought in and and taken away immediate like like an alternating current or like even a dc pulsed current where you push it and then stop and then push and stop you have to give the atoms a chance to repressure you know to to say there's no force hitting me you have to stop hitting them with force for them to be able to go back to their natural condition and then you can pressurize them again and start the current again because then there's going to be a difference in the pressure 
So again, it's just really about trapping pressure in locations where it can't get out. And that's when things stop. But there's no, there's no idea that it, that it doesn't want to get rid of the pressure. I mean, it would get rid of it. It just doesn't have anywhere to communicate the pressure to. So it just can't pressurize any more than it's pressurized. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's a way of explaining it, I think. Uh, so the other part of this is that as these atoms change or pressurize, um, so I'll draw the conductor this way, so it's like a round conductor. Um, and the, the other phenomenon is, so as, as these atoms, um, let's see, how's the way to draw it, are exchanging this pressure, so they're becoming pressurized atoms, the idea is is that they um, they they internally they're creating monopoles. So on the surface they have they're they're um, they're going um, they're <laughs> yeah there was how to say this they they have they have uh, dipoles going left to right. So going around this way, there's dipoles. So there's an atom that has a bulge this way, and then like I said, this side can be more proton strong. The other side of the atom, the back side of the atom. The back side of the atom can be more proton strong. And so that's a dipole. And so the, each one of these atoms going across this surface is creating a dipole. And those dipoles um, the, so the current's going to run this way, but dipoles are going to be created around the surface. So essentially the surface is going to be covered with magnets that are basically, um, you know, linear things that you're forcing, okay, <laughs> in a way, to be, um, round things you know so they don't they don't fit on the round surface is essentially the argument they they their end sticks out a little bit so this is grossly exaggerated but the idea i think should be understandable is that as you go around the surface the dipoles don't match up perfectly so the magnets leave a, like a sawtooth so you could sort of understand it as a you know a circle with a bunch of jagged and the jagged sides on one side are all going to be south and the jagged sides on the other side are all going to be pointing north side of the magnet so the so you can see it here is this side will be the side that's going to produce more um, black energy and this side is going to produce more red energy and that accounts for the force that the like two conductors going the same way would rec would end up creating force that would um, make them um, attract instead of repel because facing each other means clockwise for one is counterclockwise for the other kind of thing see this going this way it's black going this way it's red so obviously if I draw another same thing as this one here it would have the black force facing this way and the red force facing this way, which creates, as pointed out, attraction because there's no ref reflections happening. All right, so I don't know if I wanna push this any steps further except to do photons, right? Yeah, let's do photons. All right, so now we go back to the, the idea of the, the pressure that's holding the electrons in their positions. And the fact that the electrons don't move unless they actually consume the energy of a photon. So again, the photon can't just go in, you know, dot, 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 go into something, make it move, and then the photon dies here, like a kinetic ball. You know, one ball hits the other ball, one ball stops, one ball starts moving. Can't really happen that way, because we know photons don't do that. They don't 
become dead somewhere. The universe doesn't fill up with a bunch of dead photons. So the idea is, is that the photon has to actually go into the electron and its momentum is spread across the mass of that, fo that, that electron essentially. So like a school of fish, it absorbs the energy of a new fish and the direction of that new fish is its direction. So I could also illustrate with like a, a spinning ball. I could take anything and just spin it. Now you could push it going this way, you could push it going this way, you know, wheel spinning. It's just a wheel spinning. I can push it this way, I can push it this way, I can push it this way, I can push it this way. And all that matters. As much as it seems like it doesn't matter, it's something that's going to be remembered by the spinning wheel. <laughs> spinning wheel has a history and it's collected energy from dif these different directions and their real directions. Now you didn't see the friction that happened because of the, the, the bearings where it was spinning. The, the different ways that that energy was accounted for in the sense that the velocity accounted for the fact that it got the energy this way. So if I do it in space, right, if I take a spinning thing and try to spin it in space, well, when I give it energy this way, the whole thing's going to move. When I give it energy this way, the whole thing's going to move. So you'll see what you don't see with a spinning wheel is that the energy is real whatever way it comes in. And the same thing is true for the electron. It's going to re it retains the identity of everything that goes into it is remembered as energy in that direction. So, but anyway, so the, but the point is, is that the energy is stored in the electron. Now, how it's stored by spin or by some other mechanism, I, I don't think I need to argue that. We just know that the energy comes in in a direction and there's a a history and a memory of that and the electron is going to now move in in by some percentage to its mass in the direction in which it was hit so the electron is it holds the energy and it moves so that photon is now inside the electron effectively would be my argument and until the electron is stopped that is until this external pressure from these other electrons says no you can't go that way we want you to go this way and we want you to go this way which obviously is going to be this way <laughs> and what's going to happen is once this electron is stopped the moment it stops it's going to now give back the photon so the photon came in the electron moves then the photon goes back out and the trick is is this is a piece of the photon one piece um, so a photon, in my argument, it's electron energy, so I'll draw it in black. A photon is just little bits, these little um, force bits. And the force bits come in the two colors, red and black, and they move the speed of light. The force bits are what I've been drawing as arrows. The arrows are these force bits. Now in a photon, so I'll get, maybe I'll draw them as arrows, they're at a specific frequency. And the frequency is defined, essentially, by this movement of the electron. So the time it takes the electron to be stopped, and so it's like a pendulum swing. The pendulum you know, swings from two positions, um, back and forth. And as, it, as the swing degrades, the velocity slows down, but the period stays the same. And the same kind of thing happens for this electron. So when it's pushed by the proton, that's kind of like swinging the pendulum of the electron up. So the, the electron swang up, and that means it swang into the pressure of the other electrons in the atom. So it now has been high, it's been pressurized, and now it's going to fly back in the opposite direction. It's going to leave the atom, so to speak. And it, it's going to have um, a certain amount of momentum in doing that, but the moment it stops, so the pendulum has an arc in it that I, you know, isn't really applicable to this circumstance because it's going to come back as a rebound in the same direction in which the force came. So it's more like it hitting a trampoline. But I'm just using the pendulum to understand that the period's going to be the same at, at all these points where there's going to be 
a suppression of its progress. So when it swings out, it stops here, it releases a piece of photon. Swings out, and there's a point where now it's going too far from the proton, and so it's feeling more pressure on this side than it is from the proton side, and I think, uh, going away. well anyway, it's moving into more force, let's just put it that way, um, uh, uh, in the sense that the, the, it's, 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 <laughs> let's see how to say this, it's inside the electrons now, so it's being, now it's being almost, it, it never got, yeah, okay, so I, I drew the drawing too deep. The point is, is it, it never gets, uh, the spring never goes too far. So these two electrons, this third electron, never goes past this line of these two electrons. So there's the electron pressure is what's pushing it back. And there's a point where that stops, because this electron gets far enough away again, where this reflective energy is no longer stronger than the attraction energy to the proton and then it's going to stop again say here and when it stops there it's going to release another arrow um, yeah um, but it won't matter because that one's in the wrong direction yeah so going this way it stops okay then it swings back and then it goes this way and then it swings back but the point is is that's where the period comes from is as this pushes in it pushes back too far then it comes back stops pushes back too far comes back stops and so that ends up creating your photon at specific distances so the little photon bits are created by the resonance, so to speak, the vibration frequency of these electrons, the pressure. So if you just hit it with a little bit of energy, it doesn't go very far, just creates a little bit of energy out. So you're basically going to get back just as many arrows that hit it. So if three of these little photon things, three of these little corpuscles of energy hits it, that means it goes, it gets gets compressed closer to the other two electrons this distance becomes larger you can sort of get that right it goes from here to this new location here because it's four times it gets even closer so you can just see the more energy hitting it the more rebound pressure there's going to be and the more it's going to overshoot and then come back and then stop and then overshoot a little bit and then come back and stop and the period of each one of those rebounds will be this period. So it will give back what it got. And if you want to give back something else, right? if you want to give if you want red to come in, red frequency, and you want to give back ultraviolet, then all you have to do is find some other way to pressurize these electrons. So if you pressurize these electrons ahead of time, pressurize these atoms, then they can give you higher energy when you hit them with energy and you can change the frequency and the opposite would also be true the more you beat up on this atom and the more you um, to expand its size or something then you'll get a weaker light back like infrared so you'll bring in visible light of some kind and you'll end up getting infrared radiation back because the pressure as you're hitting it the atom might move a little bit something else and that's going to cause a kind of redshift. So if the atom moves at all, like the whole atom actually is moved by this pressure, and the proton goes this way and all the other electrons move this way, that's going to create a, a less pressure in that atom and essentially going to create less pressure in the direction you want to go. And it's going to change the period, just like if I change the period on a, on a pendulum, if I move the, the, what the pendulum is swinging on and I move it at the right time, clearly I'm going to mess up the period of the pendulum substantially slow it down or speed it up depending on which way I move it and that's essentially how you convert light from one frequency to another frequency so photons 
are absorbed always. They never purely reflect off anything. They only get absorbed and readmitted. And the only way they can be absorbed and readmitted is if they're in some kind of tension that prevents them from just keep going. So they'll just keep going <laughs> if, if they're not readmitted. Um, and if they're going in free space, they can lose the energy in numerous other directions besides sending it backwards. So that way the photon can be essentially made uh, invisible or converted essentially into gravity or magnetism or converted into some other manifestation of the force. So magnetism, the electromotive force, the current inside the wire, um, light, gravity, light, magnetism, and EMF, they're all made of these little force bits. And um, they're moving the speed of light, and they uh, only interact by moving electrons and protons, and that's it. And the electrons and protons, in a conservational way, um, inevitably give back the energy in some form. They'll give back the force. Any force that comes in will eventually come back out, um, theoretically. Just like as the atom gets made and pressurized, and you create these relationships, that pressure, that energy that went in, theoretically someday, that atom will collapse, and that energy, that pressure, will be converted again back into free energy that you'll feel as gravity or magnetism or some other force. But it's always going to be in this form. All right, there are a couple of uh, misdirections here. Not perfect, but I think I think it should give you the <laughs> enough to see that this works really well, <laughs> explaining a whole pile of complex behavior for which conventional physics has no logical explanation for why any of it happens. And this provides you with a logical explanation. Um, clearly, the electron and proton are the magnetic monopoles. They are the monopoles of charge and the monopoles of magnetism. It's the same thing. And it really just depends on um, how deeply you can charge a substance. So when you make a magnet, you create a bunch of little magnets inside, which means uh, all the atoms are getting charged, in a sense. Because they're all going red, black, red, black, red, black into making a magnet. Um, like in ferromagnetic material. But in common conductors, not every atom turns into a whole magnet. There's just high pressure atoms and neutral atoms. High pressure and neutral, or, or low pressure. But there's nothing, there's no, there's no, um, there's no monopoles, uh, there's no dipoles by necessity, only by circumstance. And the dipoles end up forming in a, in a kind of a circle around the conductor. All right, I think it's enough. So, until the next time, and such. Ooh, don't want a mistake here. Just hit the button, Gary. Okay, I'll do that. Thank you. <clears throat> it stinks. I mean, it's kind of what we wanted to do, but on turn three, you know. So I mean, we can play. We can play him just to get another creature down, so we can block. That's right. I'm gonna run you over after this turn. Should I swing him at one? <laughs>